Hello and welcome to another edition of The Open Road, where we examine different facets of open source communities. My name is Brian Proffitt, and I am with the Red Hat Open Source Program Office. And I'm Rich Bowen, also with the Red Hat Open Source Program Office. In the previous parts of this particular series, we've been talking about membership, citizenship in open source projects. And in this episode, we're gonna be talking about governance, what it looks like, how it works in specific projects or in general. And we've got two guests this, this time. Uh, one of our guests, and if you've watched our previous episodes, Greg talked about running communities minimalistically based on contribution, and it doesn't leave a lot of room for formal governance. And so he won't be featured in this particular episode, but we do encourage you to go back and listen to his thoughts about how projects run in general. Exactly, yeah, because there is governance in the Linux kernel. We don't want to <laughs> uh, imply otherwise. However, um, you know, it's fairly straightforward. Um, much of decisions are technical in nature, and what decisions that aren't technical in nature, the Linux Foundation pretty much takes care of for them. But we did venture the question out to our other two guests in this series. Um, and so first up, we wanted to talk uh, or share with you what Jack Abutbul, um, who is the community manager of Alma Linux and also the vice president of products for code notary. Um, and Jack is, again, as a reminder, at the very beginning stages of building this community around Alma Linux. So he has the advantage of being able to pick and choose what he wants, how he wants to do it. And so when we uh, ventured this question out to him, here's what he had to say. Okay, so the board is responsible for a few things. Um, the I would say the first responsibility is, uh, um, you know, a, a fiduciary responsibility. So uh, we do have money that was uh, given to the project, and we do need to make sure that we're spending that uh, correctly. So, uh, you know, uh, basically making decisions on what services we use, uh, what causes we support with the money, um, where we want to allocate the money to. So let's say uh, sponsorships or um, event participation, uh, stuff like that. That So that's the first duty. Um, the other duty uh, is basically to be the eyes and ears of community and bring anything that uh, we think needs to be taken care of to the other members' attention. So, um, you know, thankfully we've not have any, we've not had any negative uh, incidents uh, so far, but um, there have been things where, you know, someone proposed something and, uh, you know, uh, we, we wanted to make someone responsible for all of our infrastructure, technical infrastructure. And, uh, you know, I, not everyone on the board knew that person. And, you know, there was a question of, well, how much do we trust this person in order to uh, give them responsibility? You know, you're basically giving them the keys to the kingdom in a sense. So, uh, you know, the, the board uh, uh, made a decision on that uh, to, to let them do that. Um, and then um, I guess really any other, uh, how do you want to state this? Any other powers that were not given to the board, but uh, the board may need to make a decision on that comes up. Uh, that's what the board is responsible for. Certainly, we we also chose the nominating the uh, nominating committee for membership. So that was something that the board did. And um, you know, it's it's uh, if, if if it ever comes down to a question of, you know, whether there was a uh, technical. Um, uh, two, you know, two separate, um, uh, two separate technical ways we could do something, let's say, and we didn't exactly know where we wanted to uh, put our resources to and where we wanted to focus. Um, that would also be something that, uh, the board would kind of get involved in. And, and of course, by the way, I should add, 
we obviously have like a real set of bylaws and stuff that state our uh, responsibilities, but I'd rather give you the practical, you know, what it is the board does versus uh, regurgitating a, bu a bunch of bylaws. Yeah. No, and that's appreciated. So uh, you, you touched <laughs> on this in your answer. So you see the role of the board as handling both community governance and also technical governance as well. Like there's yes, no correct. application. Why, why, why is that? I'm curious. So I don't, th well, number one is size, right? Because right now I don't think we're there yet. Um, in the future, we may have something like a, uh, you know, a technical steering committee uh, to, to make those decisions. Right now we don't. But uh, I think that also uh, it, it's the way that I like the way it's set up now, because even those people on the board who are not involved in the day to day, um, uh, you know, they still get a sense of where what's going on technically. And I think that's important for them because uh, the decisions that we make will affect you know, the technical stuff. And so if they, you know, if we propose something and they have no idea what we're talking about, when we walk into a board meeting, you know, I, I don't want to spend my time trying to convince them of, hey, you know, this is why X, Y, Z, and this is why it's good for us. I'd rather them just be like actively informed of what's going on and then just be able, you know, the, the a board is there to make decisions, right? So I'd like for them to be able to come in and make a decision based on the facts of what's going on rather than having the board uh, be a session where everyone needs to kind of, you know, start exchanging information. I think that that's just, it's not productive for what the board's function is. So the first thing that Jack mentions is something that we brought up way back when we were talking about foundations and that's, that's money. Whenever money comes into it, you've got to have some people there that are um, responsible for for making the decisions of where that money goes. And uh, he sees that as, as the, the first listed goal of, of governance. And that was interesting because, you know, a lot of a lot of projects pass that decision up to a foundation. And of course, with, with Alma, the foundation and the project are the same thing, as we've said in previous episodes. Yeah, and then, and that seemed fairly straightforward. And, and then again, he went into, you know, as he said, being the eyes and ears of the community, um, which, you know, clearly is a representative form of governance uh, for the for the Alma Linux project. Um, that is not surprising for a couple of reasons. One, it's a fairly standard thing to have. You want to have make sure everybody in your community is heard. I think in this case. As we've alluded to in prior episodes, Alma Linux is very much about making sure that all parties and their community are heard. Um, mm -hmm. That is yeah. a, an action, you know, a, a, a laudable goal, um, and and I think that's a big part of their culture um, that's really shining through. What was interesting to me, and 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 I keyed in on it uh, in the interview, was the fact that the board. The single board appears to be handling also technical decisions as well. And that was a little unusual, at least in my respect. I mean, you've probably seen more project governance than I have. I mean, yeah, I, was the non-bifurcation uh, interesting to you or, or unusual? It was. And what I was listening for this time through was, was what the plan is for for the future and he kind of alludes to this he says that everything is is held within the board because they are young and small um he he used the frame the phrase technical steering committee um not because they've got one but because it's a concept that they have in mind and um he also mentioned um the the uh the membership committee so they what they what they appear to be thinking is as they grow and things become more complicated, then they can delegate to subcommittees to handle stuff. And that's, again, a very standard way of handling things when either when things become large and complicated or when the skill set of the board of directors is not sufficient to to handle those subtasks. 
And so I, I think that I, I think that it is just because they're they're young and small, but they they have this this uh, growth idea in mind for the future. Yeah. And and from a from a personal observation and also professional as well, I have to give all the Linux huge props for even contemplating and enacting this kind of governance structure so early in its career. Um, because so many projects, and, and, and I'm guilty of this just as well, especially in the early stages, start out with a few people informally, loosely working together, building a thing, and, and, and then, you know, if it takes off, then they start thinking about, oh, we should have more governance yeah. and we should have more. So yeah. for, like thinking about this from like pretty much minute one is, is to be applauded. Um, not a lot of projects do this and not a lot of projects actually think this through. And I have, you know, just in my work environment in the last, you know, few weeks have worked with a few projects where, you know, they're young and, don't have any governance and now they're running into problems with who's deciding what and who's doing this and then and my first question is well do you have any kind of governance policy in place no <laughs> so then it becomes okay well you've either got arm wrestling or you've got to build a governance policy take your pick another thing that jack did not allude to but that i've observed from outside is that they um when when they first started this board of directors, it was heavily populated by people from one company simply because that company had been most heavily involved in bootstrapping this. But very early on, they brought in people from other organizations and the, the folks from that founding company intentionally stepped back because vendor neutrality was a very important aspect of it was a thing that their community was very concerned about and, and again we've alluded to the fact that alma their their roots come from dissatisfaction with what happened with the centos community and they they did not want to have any sort of um single vendor control in their community so that was another thing they did very intentionally very early on yeah, and, and watching that is a, a, a really great observation because even as you were saying that, I was thinking, oh, that's the opposite of what happened with Rackspace and OpenStack. Um, eventually, the OpenStack Foundation was formed and, and it was very much needed, but OpenStack was very hesitant, uh, or I'm sorry, Rackspace was very hesitant to pull back initially. Um, and do that. So having a company kind of consciously letting go, because um, it's hard for any company. It can be it can be hard for Red Hat sometimes, or any other open source uh, company, because being a part of that is you know a big deal, and intentionally letting go is hard. Next, we're going to listen to some thoughts from Dave Neary, who is a uh, respected open source expert. And um, we've you've heard from him before, and here are his ideas on what is and should be involved in open source governance. Now, as you listen to this, remember that this is more general and philosophical rather than per, that, rather than referring to a specific project community. And so it's going to be a little bit of a, a broader answer. So here's what Dave had to say. Well, the first, requirement is to have one, um, to have an explicit form of governance, because all too many projects don't. I mean, there's a line that I used to use in the mid um, 2000s, which is the the median number of developers working on an open source project is zero, mm -hmm. and the median number of developers working on an active open source project is one. Um, most projects don't need a lot of formal governance. And so most projects don't have a lot of formal governance. But um, as projects start to grow, uh, communication overhead becomes difficult. Identifying who has access to what resources becomes difficult. It becomes more important to be able to protect things like uh, project trademarks or DNS records or um, you know other resources that are kind of collectively owned. But typically, there's an individual who who was the person who reserved that thing, who created the 
the domain name record um, or whatever, right? Who manages, who's, who's root on the web server, um, whatever that access point is. And so uh, step one is when there's a need to document what those control points are, what those functions are in your community and who does them. I think just having transparency in how things actually happen in your community as a starting point, super important. And then in terms of what governance model I prefer, um, I really like the idea of maintainers who sunset themselves and who kind of set explicit bounds on when they expect to step back from a maintainership position and to be conscious about cultivating um, new talent. So, so it's more, I would say, rather than a, an election or um, uh, like a, a rule by committee or any of the other forms of governance that are out there, I really like the idea of kind of a group of sage elders, for want of a for want of a better phrase, who are who term limit themselves by by convention. When you when you you've outlined that that form of governance, and that's really interesting because I to me that's a novel approach because um, I don't see that very often, um, which probably is diagnostic in and of itself. Um, but like like you you when you described that you were talking about technical issues. Do you do you feel like the role of governance needs to be um, like, for lack of a better term, bifurcated between, you know, this part takes care of technical decisions, this part takes care of community social decisions, um, or should it all be unified? Because um, that, again, is a spectrum, too. Yeah, well, if we look at what standard models are out there, uh, certainly among, for example, Linux Foundation uh, projects, uh, it's very common to have a technical steering committee and a project board of directors. And the board of directors has budget authority, hiring and firing authority, um, setting, uh, setting broad strokes of strategy for the project. And then the technical leadership is very much focused on how the project produces what it produces. But I will say I didn't mention uh, technical matters in when I was talking about the, the group of sage elders. Um, I didn't explicitly mention it, but it's certainly implicit in most open source projects that that's mm -hmm. what a maintainer does. Um, and so a lot of the technical steering committees, for example, do have people who are more focused on branding or uh, who are users and users who are, who, are, who are vested in the outcome of the project. Um, so I think that's a model. Uh, it's not the ideal model in my mind. I, if, if you're looking for an example, by the way, of a project that has uh, seen its original maintainers kind of right off into the sunset and replace themselves before leaving. I think Subversion is a really good example of a project that defined we have a leadership set of five people. And I can't remember who the first Subversion uh, maintainer to leave was. Um, it may have been Ben Collins Sussman. Yeah, Ben or but, Greg. Um, yeah. But as soon as somebody left the, the maintainership of uh, the subversion project, they were involved in the conversation for who was going to replace them. And, and I really liked that approach of a conscious succession. Um, let me think, what was that? There was another point. Um, I think one of the things that's important is that, you know, when you think of maintainership of a project, that you don't just restrict yourself to technical maintainership. Um, it's always going to be tricky because there's a natural, like open source projects start from source code, um, typically. And so they start because an engineer starts to write some code to solve a problem that they have. And it's only when you reach a certain tipping point in terms of popularity and in terms of utility that end users, people who are interested in documentation, people who are interested in um, creating user case studies or you know updating the website that these people become more active and more important to the project and i think it's important to recognize that those new functions even though they come later are equally as important as the function of creating the code so that was definitely a journey 
um, but a really fascinating one because he starts out talking where we were sort of left off uh, a minute ago, which is, you know, a lot of these new projects do not have governance um, and, and usually come to it a little bit later down the, down the line. But as always, Dave outlines a very clear path uh, for what governance should look like. He also kind of starts at the same point that that uh, Jack did. Um, it, it's he didn't mention money explicitly, but he's talking about the the responsibility, the practical and le legal ownership of assets, whether that's servers or whether it's money or whether it's the IP of the code itself. Um, and, and this is this is how. Um, the Apache Software Foundation governance started to begin with because a business it happened to be IBM. They wanted to they wanted to enter into a legal arrangement with this ragtag bunch of developers, and they're like, "Who do we write the check to, or who do we sign the contract with?" And that's where the idea of that governance started to come about. Yeah, um, and and yeah. So anytime we get a group of people together and build something. There are going to be assets. It's going to be, and you know, as Dave said, it's going to be a domain. It's going to be um, a trademark um, for a logo or a name or something like that. There's, and, and sometimes it's infra um, as well. There's going to be assets, and and it's interesting because my take on governance has always been who, you know, when you have a problem, who decides, you know, who decides it. Yeah. Um, that's the boiled down version of my governance in my head, but our guests have both emphasized asset management and or resource management in some way as the first thing to focus on. And I, uh, that, that gives me a lot to think about. I think that we have all been involved in some way in a project where individual ownership of an asset ended up being a problem, either because that person was unwilling to share or because they were they disappeared from the project and you couldn't get access to it anymore and um i've encountered that in three or four different projects uh and you know and i, I see you smiling and you know which one i'm thinking of but uh <laughs> it's, it's a it's a common problem and and making that making that decision earlier rather than at need rather than when the problem happens um, ends up it ends up saving a lot of 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 personal feelings burning bridges and relationships because you already know what the answer is right exactly and the expectation is there and and you don't have a lot of hurt feelings or yeah. or, or co more conflict than you actually need so yeah um, asset management is certainly a key part of governance um, and then Dave went into, and again, uh, you know, I, I've been around the block, but I may have missed this somewhere along the line. Uh, although when he brought up the example later, it was great. The idea of maintainers who sunset themselves, um, which, you know, having heard the entire conversation again, yeah, that is certainly a thing that people do. I would love to see that more. Um, I, I don't think, you know, I don't think people do that enough. Um, and and the idea that people would just sort of say, okay, I'm going to do this for a certain amount of time and then I'm out. Um, that's great. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I don't know that I've ever worked with project governance that had term limits mm -hmm. or an explicit notion of, of uh, when I'm going to, to uh, sunset my position. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that we all kind of are bad at, at letting go of something that we have built and um, invested our identity in. So uh, yeah, you're right. I would love I would love to see more of that. Well, yeah, and I'm and I'm kind of coming at it from the perspective of community health, because in community health, one of the things that we look at is what when you have a new person come into your project what is their path you know what what can they do like what does it take for them to become uh, a, a committer what does it take for them to become a maintainer 
you know, is, is there, if they are interested, what is their path of growth within that project? And if you have a layer of maintainers, for instance, in your project who will never leave, mm -hmm. then you block their advancement. And, and maybe their love for the project and the code that they're building and everything like that. Maybe that passion is enough, is enough to carry them through but sometimes it might not be. Um, and, and now you've got yourself in a situation where you don't have, you know, new talent coming in and mm -hmm. shaking things up and you possibly will lose the talent you have because they might say, well, maybe you don't regard my contributions as good enough to be a maintainer or, you know, whatever level we're talking about. You also get in the situation where the, that that layer of of maintainers that that carry all the burden um don't feel like there is a graceful way for them to exit mm -hmm. um or or they worry that if if and when they exit their achievements will be forgotten about um devalued so i th this kind of intentional succession planning seems really healthy for the project and for the individuals and uh, yeah, it, it, it's an idea that you know we we've seen here and there in open source, but but yeah, it would be it would be great to have more projects do this intentionally. Right, and and maybe you know succession planning might be a a a, a way to get to this point without you know like active term limits or something like that. Mm -hmm. And 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 just to remind everybody, you know. Uh, our uh, our other guest, Greg Crow Hartman, who's not on this today's episode, has mentioned um, the fact that there is clear succession planning within the Linux kernel project. Um, so um, that is actually in an episode that's going to be coming up, but he's going to be talking about that a little bit. And that is something that is, you know, not, again, term limits, but that is something that the kernel project is doing. Um, and then one more topic that that we that we raised with both of our uh, guests was the 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 bicameral is one of the words that's used the bifurcation between between uh, technical leadership versus you might say governance or community or project leadership and and uh, treating those separately and you know Dave talks about how it's it's fairly common for for the asset management, fiduciary management aspect to be handled by one group while the technical details are handled by the other. That's That's been my experience with a number of organizations that I've been part of. You know, I, I, I'm on the board of Oasis and there the, the technical leadership is absolutely separate from the board of directors governance and never the twain shall meet you know the, the board of directors at apache never tinkers at the technical level in projects ever so that is fairly common model yeah and 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 kind of humorously i often wondered if both sides really want that to always be because when i talk to developers especially on new projects their eyes glaze over when I start talking about governance. They're like, what, why, why do we have to deal with this? To them, it seems like an unnecessary bureaucratic hurdle. They're like, I just want to build something. I want to contribute to For many to projects this. it is, right? Right, right. And and they're small enough that it totally works. I mean, Dave mentioned it you know, early in his, uh, his comments to us. You know, a lot of these projects are very small and they're just, there's no need for formal government governance and that's cool. But, you know, this, this idea that it's a bureaucratic hurdle for developers often is seen. And then you have the idea that, well, okay, but on the other side, we don't want the developers messing around with the quote, important stuff like money and you know, events and things like that, which is not really on either side. That's not really a good, yeah. healthy attitude. Um, Dave kind of alluded to this towards the end of his answer where he was talking about, you know, maintainership is not just about technical contributions. It's about all the other contributions. 
And if you look at it from that point of view, I, I think the argument can be made that you could have a more unified uh, form of governance. I don't know. I think that that is the, uh, the end of, of what we're talking about in this episode. Um, we, we've got um, one, more, one more question coming up in a future episode. So we do have more to say on the, uh, the general notion of project citizenship. Uh, we would also like to hear from from you all what your thoughts are. Um, exactly. Yeah, so next episode, we're going to talk about, you know, we're talking about this governance model uh, and whatnot. So now the next question is going to be, how are the leaders in a project selected? We'll have all three of our guests back, and they'll be answering that question in our next episode. So until then, my name is Brian Prophet. And I'm Rich Bowen. And thank you for joining us on The Open Road.